Alright, and welcome back to Developer Commentary. My name is Mike Stout. And I am Tony Garcia. And Tony, we're back. We are back. And for this a time, transcendent episode of Ratchet and Clank of your Arsenal awesome Developer Commentary. This, this, oh, in HD, don't forget. In HD. Yes. Always in HD. Oh, always. Uh, and uh, this is my level. This is Quark's hideout. This is the snow level of the game. We. I think we had some sort of a budget where we had to have a snow level. <laughs> it was in the contract? Yeah, we had a snow level and a lava level and a facility and a factory. And I think, uh, I'm not sure what I, oh, Tony. Yeah? It's the snow ninjas. The lawn I mean, ninjas. The, it's the lawn ninjas. These, uh, these were a, a joke in Ratchet 2. Yeah, uh, in the Megacorp uh, ad. And I loved them so much. That I just I had to have them in this level, Tony. Uh, that was one of the really cool things about um, being a designer is you could do you 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 got to choose what the enemies were that would be in your level to a certain extent. Like you 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 didn't always get to get exactly what you wanted, but a lot of time you know they'd say, okay, so you have uh, you have the 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 tyranoids in your level, and then uh, you know you get to make up your own. For, for one of them. And then uh, I got to say, okay, so I want to have uh, robots that look like Captain Quark and lawn ninjas in the level. And I could do that because I was the designer. So in, in that respect, that it was sort of a very freeing, cool thing about about being a designer on these games. But then, uh, you know, like you said, you, you also got to do it as a programmer. Like you got to decide that there would be ninjas. Uh, well, I mean... There was a process, but yes. I mean, there was definitely a lot of creative freedom that you got as a programmer. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly, Andy K, Andy Klinzig, did this level. Or at least he did those Captain Quark robots. That sounds right. Uh, and he did the amazing Terminator upper skeleton crawling at you <laughs> thing. Oh, God. He, uh, he put that in one day, and I had no idea it was going to happen because it wasn't something I would thought about. But he, he went to the... Uh, he went to the, the character artists and the animators, and he's like, look, we got to do this. we got to have this thing. And then it just sort of showed up one day, and I was like, that is the, that is the most rad thing <laughs> anyone has ever decided to put into any game. And, uh, uh, and it worked out really well. I was, I was very happy with it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Captain Quark robots, uh, they happened because I really liked... The idea that Captain Quark would defend his base with copies of himself. It seems uh, I mean, like this, MO. Yeah, it seems it seems reasonable, right? Like you'd kind of expect Quark to do that. But also he, we know he's a, a a horror for Gadgetron. Right? Like he tries all their products, he, he he markets them. So it would make sense to me that he would have the lawn ninjas, which were uh, I suppose not Gadgetron technically, but you know, they were, they were made by an intergalactic weapons company. And it seems like that's, that, you know, it would be up Quark's alley to just order something straight out of the, uh, out of the, 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 the catalog, you know? So I wanted to have an enemy that was in the catalog and an enemy that was something that would show sort of how vain he was. And I think it worked out pretty well. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the way that these turned out. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I thought, I seem to recall there was a little bit of drama or something regarding the Lawn Ninjas where not everybody was entirely on board. I might just be imagining. I don't remember any drama. So if there was, it was probably... Behind your back? Uh, That's possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's entirely possible. I mean, I know you used to talk all sorts of shit behind my back. So. To your front as well. <laughs> That's what she said. Uh, so, right. uh, who oh, came up with the teleport pad? Oh God. Okay, so because I remember, it was so the, uh, 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 correct me if I'm wrong here. I remember the first iteration of the teleport pad was teleport anywhere, and it yes. broke everything horribly in ridiculous ways. And we just had to find a way to pair it back to the point where it was reasonable. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. The uh, uh, 
the warp pad originally was a little disc that you threw out kind of like the wrench. And uh, uh, I remember everybody, like, uh, uh, so the, the, the gadget was decided on very early in the process. Like it, I think we decided that we were going, whoa. Quackeray, Tony? It's a bit expensive. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but we've got it. Yeah, but you don't know. We're getting better stuff later. I don't know. I don't think it's worth right. 200000 but, I mean, you're the one All playing. Right, I'll, I'll hold off on the Quackeray. That's fine. But uh, uh, where was I going with that? The, the, the teleport pad was designed very early, and... Yeah, and uh, it was always just sort of... It was like, this is going to be really easy. How hard can it possibly be to teleport someone from some way to another place, right? So... We never the really. Is, of course, very easy. Yes, like taking taking someone from one position and putting them in another position is incredibly easy. Uh, but the ramifications of it are huge. Yeah, absolutely. Right. If the player can decide, I will be here now instead of over here, then uh, you know they they can break the game in all kinds of ways. Like for example, everybody always talks about the uh, first person wrench throw glitch that lets you jump up walls right uh with the it was it was much worse than that with the uh the warp pad like it it broke everything well, especially if you like throw it level. like a bomb anywhere that you could feasibly get a bomb to uh the teleport pad could get to and because we we decide we, because we decided to implement the teleport pad so late in development uh we didn't know what those metrics were right we didn't know how far you'd be able to throw a teleport pad so we didn't say okay whenever whenever a level is made uh, everything has to be X number of meters away from the player so that he can't throw a teleport pad anywhere he's not supposed to right that's normally how you'd handle that problem but the the warp pad was I think literally the last gadget to go that into the feels game. right uh, and as such we just didn't do that kind of planning for it so when when it went into the game as designed uh, it broke everything, and we did not have time to fix it. There was just no, no way that we could possibly ship the game on time and have the warp pad in it. So, you know, the the consequence of that was either cut the warp pad, or vastly limit the warp. Yep. Pad. And since since we already had a number of uh, there are, there are a number of places in the game where we had said, okay, you'll use the warp pad to get secrets. Uh, we couldn't just cut it. We had to, uh, oh, fuck. Sorry. Ah, uh, we couldn't just cut it. We had to, we had to figure out some sort of interim, sl uh, solution for it. So it ended up sort of like, uh, there was a gadget in Ratchet and Clank 1 that all it did was unlock a single optional door. Do you remember that gadget? Uh, no. It was, it, like, in a giant Clank level and... It just opened one door in the entire game. I forget what it was called, but basically it's the same thing, right? Where we, we realized late in the game that we could not possibly make it work, but we couldn't cut it, so we just scaled it way back. And that was that was the story of the warp pad. And uh, I, I feel for the warp pad because technically that was all my fault. What? How is it all your fault? <laughs> I, I was the one who designed the warp pad initially and... Uh, oh, and just said teleport wherever? Well, it wasn't teleport wherever. It was basically like um, you throw it like a wrench swing. Like we were we were severely... When I got the warp pad, I said to myself, okay, this could probably break anything, so let's, let's design it to be very limited. You could only throw it out, uh, uh, you know, directly in front of you. It hugs the ground. It doesn't go out like a bomb, right? It, it shoots straight ahead, sort of like the wrench but different, and okay. uh, that was the original design for it. And, you know, it's supposed to get you across gaps, like that, the moving platform at the beginning of this level, you were supposed to, uh, like there were lasers, you couldn't couldn't just ride the platform all the way through, so you had to use the warp pad. There were three or four other setups in this level that needed it. So, um, and we knew that we didn't want you to be able to get through this level until you'd gotten through Iridia and gotten the warp pad. So we couldn't just cut it, right? So, uh, because I had called for a design that was so much more open than it could have been, uh, you know, we we were we had to scale it much further back than we would have if I'd gone for something more limited. But the design I had decided on was actually kind of limited from the get-go. So, 
in a way, it was and it wasn't my fault, which is why I feel a little weird talking about the, the warp pad in general, because it was kind of my fault, but it also wasn't. Well, I mean, I feel the same way. I, I feel the same way about the warp pad that I do about the Visibomb. And uh, the Visibomb, fucking Visibomb cannon, was the most pain in the ass weapon we had in Ratchet and Clank 1. And 2. Well, see, this is what I was about to get to. I remember just Ratchet and Clank 1, it was such a pain in the ass because the minute the Visibomb is in the game, it affects the way you have to build all your levels. Right, because. Uh... You have to build every level to account for the Visibomb. Because if the Visibomb can fly anywhere, it can fly behind things that only have one side. Um, right. I don't know. And I mean, you can also see a lot of things that you're not supposed to be able to see, and, you know. You have to limit where the Visibomb can go, and it triggers enemies, and like something might be occluded. Like that's the thing; it's, it can kill your frame rate because you could fly it way back out and then look back to the level. You could uh, potentially crash the game in that instance. And you have enemies that might just be idling or invisible because Ratchet's not near them, but now you see that they're idling or invisible and, or whatever. And worse, you can like, kill them when we hadn't expected that you'd be able to kill them which could mean that you couldn't even complete the level. Right. There's just so much shit that goes on with the Visible Bomb and you have to account for it in everything that you do. Oh. And uh, it was a huge pain in the ass in Ratchet 1. And then in Ratchet 2, we they decided, okay, we're going to bring back some weapons for Ratchet and Clank 1. And when they chose the Visible Bomb, I was like, are you fucking crazy? It's the one weapon that requires the most work. <laughs> That's the one you want to fucking bring back? And that's how I kind of feel a little bit about teleport pad. It's just kind of like you don't realize the ramifications as to how much work is actually. Wow, are those the heavy crates? I don't think we've seen those yet. Oh yeah, the heavy. No, they've been a couple times. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things where the minute you allow the player to have a greater movement set that is more than his normal core movement, um, it factors into the way you build everything. Right. Like, we know how far Ratchet can jump. We know ev everything about Ratchet's metrics, right? Like, that's why we had that uh, in the Insomniac Museum in Ratchet 2. That's why we had that tower with all those slopes and heights and stuff in it, right? Was so that we could we could test and see how far and how high we wanted him to be able to go. And any time that he can go further or higher than that, well, the game can break. It can crash. It can do any number of things that can totally hose you you know, in the days leading up to when you're shipping it. And you really don't want that to happen because that's when stuff gets cut in ways that are unacceptable. Yeah. And uh, that's why, I mean, had the had the teleporter glove existed from the very beginning and all those things had been lined out for people, then maybe we would have been able to fix things on a case-by-case -case basis. But that, right. I mean, if that doesn't we happen... You're just setting yourself up to get screwed down the line. We would have had a lot more time to fix it. We would have had, you know, we would have known what the metrics were, so we would have had a lot of options for dealing with it. But since it came in so late and was planned so early, the combination of those two things just meant that we had to do some weird stuff. Um, oh, one note. Um, there was a, a, a camera fly-through cutscene before we uh, came into this area. Uh, do, do you remember it? No, but okay. Uh, like, basically, it showed Captain Quark behind a force field. It uh, And then it sort of pans over to show the crack that you're supposed to take a clank into. Yeah. And uh, so that was all done programmatically, and it wasn't supposed to have been done programmatically. There was originally supposed to be a cutscene there where Ratchet talks to Quark. and uh, uh, But this level was done so late in production that we actually had run out of animation time. We didn't have any more... Fuck... We didn't have any uh, uh, any resources to actually do. Sorry, we didn't have any resources to actually do that cutscene. So the cutscene got cut, but people would have no idea to make that ninety degree turn to. Uh, uh, to to put Clank in that that little tiny hole right why would you think that we never make you do that so uh so what we had to have what we had to do was force poor andy, andy k 
to code up a cutscene <laughs> in an engine that was terrible at doing programmer-driven cutscenes. And I remember that being a huge problem for him. There were tons of bugs, because like you could shoot off the Visabomb and then do it. You could throw any number of gadgets and then screw that cutscene up. So poor Andy K had to deal with a bunch of bugs because we ran out of animation time. Uh, I think it was Andy K. It might actually have been uh, whichever programmers in charge of the Clank segments. Uh, so uh, one thing that I, I mentioned a little earlier, but uh, I know people uh, people have asked for us to talk about it more, uh, was how secrets get into the game. And not like Easter eggs, because we've talked about that. Right. But how, you know, like the planned secrets, like... Uh, uh, you know, like hidden platinum bolts, or secret areas that have a ton of bolts in them, or, you know, all that stuff. Like, how does that get into the game? And, uh, for the most part, that stuff is planned, right? Like, uh, every designer knows when he's designing their levels, uh, that, uh, uh, there needs to be a certain number, usually it was three, a certain number of secrets in the level. And that was just a requirement that Brian Algar set for us when we designed all the levels in Ratchet 3. And that wasn't always the case in all the Ratchets, right? So, uh, uh, especially in the first Ratchet, like a lot of that stuff came in at the end and was a huge surprise and was a lot of work for everybody. So around this time we had started uh, uh, pre-planning, right? But another, uh, another, oh man, really? <sighs> But a, uh, a number of the secrets would come from, uh, you know, like, if the if the testers were able to get to areas that you shouldn't be able to get to. You know, like, uh, an area that, it doesn't break the game, but, you know, you can use high jumps or wall jumps or whatever to get there. And we hadn't intended you to, but then we would uh, we just decide that, it okay, that's part of the game now, we're going to make it work. And then we would. So there were two ways that, that those kinds of secrets got into the game. Nice. Oh. <sighs> it's nice that you said nice right as I died, too. Yeah, well, you die so much that it's hard for me to, I mean, that's going to happen. One of these days, Tony, we need to have you videotape yourself playing a game so that you can show everybody how much better you I are. I think we did that in the last episode, and I was always just way, way better. Uh, I don't think you were. Uh, if I remember correctly, you were always dying just as much as I was. No, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like me. <laughs> doesn't sound like something I would do. It, it, you know, denying it sounds like you, though. Because uh, <laughs> if there's one thing that sounds like Tony Garcia, it's... That's right, Tony. I called you a whiner. What are you going to do about it? Uh, nothing. I'm, I'm going to let that one stand. I think my record speaks for itself. I think everybody will know how much better I am than you at Ratchet and Clank. Or at life, for that matter. Who was it that, uh, uh... What, weren't you talking shit one time and you said, uh... Perhaps in this game, but in the game of life you're losing or something? That wasn't me. Roommate? That was one of my roommates in college. Uh, <laughs> it was the most devastating insult I've ever seen somebody deliver to somebody else. Did he? Uh, did he? Did you learn how to talk shit from him, or did he learn how to talk shit from no, you? No, I think was it, it was just it, it was it was just one of those things that was he wasn't a he wasn't a, much of a shit talker. It was just one of those things. There we were in the middle of an argument. And there was a lot of frustration going around. And it's just something he threw out there off the cuff. Uh, <laughs> it was incredibly personal, and uh, yeah, it, it was just one of those things. You know, sometimes when you're arguing with somebody, it gets a little bit too personal, a little bit too heated. That's never happened to us, right, Tony? Uh, well, apparently. I mean, this is a... I've got another preview for another future, much better episode than this one. Yeah, I mean, I know we said that this episode would be the second coming of Jesus, but we really meant the next episode. Right. Um, apparently, there was a big argument at some point that you apparently would refuse to let go. And I've moved on, uh, you know, been the better man. You apparently are unwilling to move past it forgive and forget as it were that's true and that was this game wasn't it i i can forgive tony but i can, but this mind does not forget there's a lot of clank right now so much clanking 
Yep. I, uh, I also designed this segment. Uh, for some reason it seems like Ken did these lasers. I don't... Uh, I'm not sure if I'm right on that, but it, it seems like he did them. So maybe Ken coded the plank segments. I don't know why, but those laser patterns just scream Ken to me. He's got a signature, that's what I'm saying. Did you know he's working at Harmonix now? Uh, I did know. Yeah. I had just, I heard that very recently. Look at you occasionally paying attention to what your friends are doing. Eh, it comes out every now and again. Yeah. Alright, looks like we just finished. We get to see Quark in his pajamas. We get to shame talking him into the end of Act Two. Vid comic Quark. Oh, that. Well, I don't expect you to understand. You probably look at me and think I'd give anything for a body like Love that. Love those pajamas, man. They're really good. I like that he still wears his boots and gloves. <laughs> and his mask. He's got a little hole in the top for his little antenna. Iron hard abs. Ah, yes, but despite my outward appearance of utter perfection, well, um... Deep inside, you're a cowardly wuss? No, not exactly. When I escaped from that... Does he have a little flap in the back? I don't know. It, he has to have a little flap in the back. Like, uh... He can't possibly not have a flap in the back. Isn't that how you do those pajamas? Like... It seems like they would a do a little flap in the back. There's a little pooping hole? <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it would it be used for. I don't know what it's called. I mean, it's 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 either a pooping hole or a shit latch. I don't know. I mean, do you have a better term for it? The flap in the back, I think, is a pretty good term for it. You think maybe that was the <laughs> That, that was, was probably the, the better term for it, the one we were originally using. <laughs> I gotta tell. Yes! Oh, look, it's there! Alright, sorry. I don't know why that was so fascinating. Well, I guess that's it. Oh, man, look at all that non-geometry you can see. Are we done? That's it? Oh, dude, there's no snow in this level. The snow effect is gone. Oh. Shame on you, Idle Minds. Shame. Whoa, whoa. Different. <laughs> Tony, the internet will not accept Shades of Grey. It's different. All right. So uh, for developer commentary, I'm Mike Stout. And I'm Tony Garcia. Uh, and Poop Hatch. <laughs>